वेलकम मैम वेलकम वेलकम Well, while the food is being set for us, uh, I might as well continue from where we left off. You had just witnessed at the mosque the second prayer of the day. The Muslim is obligated to pray five times a day, every day of the year. The first one is before sunrise. The second one was the afternoon prayer. The third one is between now and sunset, the late afternoon we call it. The fourth one at sunset, and the fifth one before going to bed. The Jews were commanded in the book of Daniel to pray three times a day, and Jesus Christ He told His disciples as I pray unceasingly. <laughs> that doesn't mean continuous hallelujah, hallelujah, <laughs> hail Mary, hail Mary. No, no. What it to me meant means is that constantly aware of the presence of God. So in other words, with that feeling, whatever you do will be a prayer. You know how I speak to my brother, how I do my business. Conscious always that God is watching me. It's a constant state of prayer. That's, so we Muslims are between the Jews and the Christians. We say, why not five times a day? As much as we need physical sustenance three times a day, why not a quick spiritual injection <laughs> five times a day? And that is what you witness the second prayer of the day. As you were seated there, leaning against the wall, you were all facing north. Everybody was facing north. Because Mecca is to the north of South Africa, but if you had gone to the east, you find all the mosques would be facing west. From the western countries, they'll be all facing east, and from the northern hemisphere, they all will be facing south. Reason, as the young man was explaining to you upstairs, that uh, picture of the, of the of Mecca with the Kaaba, the cube building in the center. Now that is the focus of the whole Muslim world in that direction. Now we focus in that direction not because God is there. Because the Holy Quran tells us, "Wallahi al-Mashriq wal-Maghrib," says to Allah belongs the East and the West. For aina ma tuwallu, for sama wajhu Allah. And whichever way you turn is the presence of Allah, meaning God is omnipresent. Whether we look up or whether we look down or whether we look sideways, He is everywhere. So that only symbolizes our unity. Facing in that direction, you must have noted that we say, "Allah Akbar." Everybody raises his hands up to the shoulders, just almost touching the ears, and he's saying, "Allah is the greatest." In other words, he's signifying that our divorce ourselves from all earthly things, I now solely contemplate on God. So saying, we read chapters and verses from the Holy Quran, celebrating the praises of God, and we go into different postures, and in every posture we celebrate His praises. Now, while we are at it. You know, you can ask any questions. By the way, what happened? What not? Why this? Why that? You are, you have the what's the freedom? Freedom of, of the IPC. I think before you give the freedom, I've got to say a few things. All right, before right, hand over the right. <laughs> Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, I declare that there is none worthy of worship but Allah, and I bear witness. That the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is his messenger. I begin with the universal Islamic greeting of peace. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. It is for me and the IPCI a distinct privilege and pleasure to be able to welcome the Durban Business Professional Women's Club and its president Barbara Todd here this afternoon. We know that as professional people, it's not easy for you people to find the time. So we are highly appreciative of the time that you have taken to be with us. When we invited you people out, we would like you to bear in mind it was in the spirit of the changing South Africa. For too long, political, ideological, cultural, religious barriers have kept us apart. And today, whilst our leaders, like Dr. Mandela, Dr. Butlezi, and President Dikler, are wrestling with the complexities of the South African problem, to find this new South Africa, the initiative has got to come at our level to meet, to transcend these barriers, to be able to understand what makes each of us South Africans 
from different groups take. See, a new South Africa is not going to come about by the signing of some paper and putting up a sign that says under new management. It's still got to be worked at attitudes, etc. has got to be changed. And we believe that, that this type of initiative, especially your group, which is in South Africa now for over 43 years, and is represented in over 60 countries, and has uh, advisory status to the United Nations, you have a tremendous role to play. And we are aware of how strong the women's lobby is. Because the French have a saying that the women control everything because they control those that control everything. <laughs> so on that basis, in that spirit, we would like to welcome you here today. Under a banner of openness and candor, we're not going to have formalities. We don't have any agendas hidden and otherwise. So on behalf of the president of the IPCI, Mr. Didat, its staff members, its members, its trustees, and over one billion Muslims all over the world, in a true spirit of brotherhood, friendship, we would like to welcome you here today. We are going to have lunch, during lunch and after lunch, the floor is open to ask as many questions, suggestions, ideas, any contributions you may have. We will even welcome your criticisms. And at the end of lunch, we have some mementos for you to take away and including, as I said, that won't be ready now, obviously, because it's being shot, but sometimes next week, through your president, we will make available to you a video recording of this occasion here today, which in my mind is a historic one. Mm -hmm. We would also like to impose upon your president at the end of the session by asking her to say a few words, if you don't mind. <laughs> With that, I say Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, and I think we will eat. Thank Meaning, you. in the name of God, get started. <laughs> <laughs> let me let me give the lead. Yes, go ahead. We we people from the east generally start with the pudding. You know, the you Westerners you end with the pudding, we begin with the pudding. There's a philosophy behind that as well. <laughs> yes. We start with sweets. You people end with sweets. <laughs> No, there is no religious significance, no, except that in our minds, you see, the, it's, this is more polite and cultured to have your head covered. Uh, like the Westerner, in his culture, you see, you must take off your hat to show yes. respect. Yes. For example, if an African wants a job and says, Sagbona, Mrs. Sagbona, Funam Sabenzo, and he, he's got a hat on or a cap on, there's no chance of him getting a job. He says, this guy is, you know, yes. <laughs> he's, he's, he's yeah. But he says, he takes her down and says, say what I miss is, he's got a chance. <laughs> <laughs> so, to us now, this is, you know, more, um, this is respectful. Mm -hmm. And to the Westerner, it's all in the mind. It's all in the mind. Mm -hmm. You think this way is respectful and we think this way is respectful. There's no religious significance. I could think of so many questions earlier. <laughs> <laughs> no, they'll come. Yeah. Miss them extra calories. Mm. <laughs> Maybe no words, women and folk are not allowed in the mosque. No, they are allowed. But what is called, see, in Islam, there is a segregation of the sexes. Men and women are not allowed to freely intermingle. So, in the absence of a separate facility, they pray at home. Like in this mosque now, they have just provided that there is a hall at NX. That they are in the mosque and yet they are out of the mosque. So the only thing Islam says is that every obligation which is incumbent upon the man is also incumbent upon the woman. Mm -hmm. We pray five times a day, the male, women also, same. You fast for one whole month, the women must do the same. Charity, if you have your own money, you give the same charity as the man is supposed to give. So there is no exemption from any religious responsibility. But religious reason that culturally we don't intermix men and women. Uh, the reasons are, of course, that uh, the women, the Holy Prophet Muhammad has said, that the greatest blessing for a man is a virtuous wife, a woman. But that woman can become the greatest destruction, you know, suppose in our prayer, the lady was standing in front of me, 
And if you saw rows and rows behind each other, we were standing shoulder to shoulder. And uh, we said, Allahu Akbar, <laughs> the lady in front, I noticed, you know, 24, 36, 36, 24, 36. And the mind goes, it's, mm, what a lovely figure she's got. <laughs> Instead of concentrating on God, you start concentrating about the woman. Then as we stand shoulder to shoulder, because the Holy Prophet Muhammad has said that when you stand up for prayer, you must not leave gaps between you and the other person so that the devil might get in between you and your brother. Okay. Now the devil he was talking about was not the guy we see in the art gallery, Durban Museum complex, second floor. There's a huge painting there by some great artist where a beautiful woman, well proportioned with wings, she's got a <laughs> wand in her hand and she's directing the devil to go to hell. And you can see that devil flying off, you know, in the picture. You can see him flying off with wings, a uh, ready complexion, horns, and with a tail with a barbed hook. Now, Muhammad wasn't talking about one like that. Because, you know, as is, you know, if anybody saw one like that, you flee for dear life. <laughs> me too, me too. Now I go on stand by him to be tempted. But now, the one he was talking about was we ourselves. Mm. Our racial pride, our arrogance, our riches. I am white, he's black, I am rich, he's poor. He says, no. You don't have that shoulder to shoulder. I can't get away from my brother, and my brother can't get away from me. They are there. But instead of my brother, my sister is standing next to me, for example. Yeah. And I say, Allahu Akbar. <laughs> and the night, cushy, warm feeling. I get, you know. <laughs> I'm wondering whether she's not the greatest. <laughs> and so, so these are distractions for which reason Islam says, give them a separate but equal facility. Separate but equal. So there's no um, subservience, actually. No. They have the roles. Men have the roles, women have the roles, and they are, we say, complementary to one another. Mm -hmm. So you can say they are equal. In Islam, the women and the men are equal. They have, they have equal rights. But now in the house now, uh, generally, you see, now the man has, the Quran tells us that man is a degree above women must sound like we are what you would describe it because he's the breadwinner because i supply my wife with all her needs then naturally i have and says look dear we will go for holiday to cape town not to johannesburg mm. she can't tell me no, no no i have equal rights i said no I, but but as, as as it is said she stoops to conquer you know if she gives in i say yes dear where you want to go there's no there's no tug of war between husband and wife if she just says, she's as if creates in my mind the feeling that the choice is mine, I just can't help it asking her, where you want to go? And it's yeah. happening all the time. You see, I used to be in, um, in Pakarini, this side, I'm Zinto. And I had more of my people in Port Shepston than in Stanga. But every so time, weekends, whenever we move, we're moving to Stanga. We're moving to Stanga. We don't go to Port Shefton. My own relations are in Port Shefton, but my wife's relations are in Stanga. So it's, it's like the coach pulling the engine away every time. Now that's how it, <laughs> life works. You know? What was that? Yes. <laughs> 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 okay, no, not uh, currents, um, um, not I've got, thank you. No, I believe, for instance, in, um, I suppose every culture does differ slightly in interpretations. Um, yes, ma'am. In the Middle East, for instance. Yes. yes. Um, Saudi Arabia. Yes, ma'am. They discourage or don't allow women to travel on their own. Yes, ma'am. Would that be for their protection? Correct. You see, now we ourselves too. We wouldn't like our daughters to be going out alone. You know, uh, we, our son is going to Johannesburg. He said, "Well, you can come lift." 
Yeah. But I won't in a hurry tell my daughter to thumb lift. Yes. Mm-hmm. yes. I tell my brother, you can thumb lift, you know. Yes. But I can't tell my wife, go and thumb lift. Yes. You know the obvious reasons. Because man, the predator, yes. he is waiting there, you know, to t- exploit your, the weakness of woman. So in Islam, uh, we are not allowed to be alone with a woman who is not my wife, mm-hmm. or my sister, or my mother, or my daughter. Mm. Everybody else at a respectable distance. Mm. For example, if I was traveling to Johannesburg mm. and I witnessed you, saw you, standing there by the roadside, coming a lift. You drive straight past. My religion says don't give her a lift. My religion tells me I should not give you a lift. Why? Because you are white? No, no, no. no. Even if a woman of my own race, it tells me I should not give her a lift. Because it is a challenge to man's manliness. We are two traveling together alone in the car. Before we reach our destination, I want to know whether she is married, any children, how long you married, is it 15 years, any children, is it no, is it Mr. Todd working hard enough? <laughs> These are the thin age of the witch. You know, we're trying to know, uh, have you got a boyfriend? Is it no? Is it, <laughs> you say when you go on the other side, you know, you know, I can take you to the cinema, you know, you can go to the dance. At the back of the mind, there's something more than a dance and a dinner is involved. Mm. So the creator knows the machine that he has made is no, keep them at a respectable distance. The lady is there with a gentleman, maybe her brother, give her a lift, act of charity. Or maybe her husband, give her the lift, father and daughter, give them a lift, act of charity. But alone, mm. it's a don't tempt providence. So, it's the practical aspect of... Uh, I think that leads on to a point about the exploitation mm-hmm. of women by society. Right. Which I'm sure as your group you might have come across this quite often. Very much so. I think the anecdote that you were relating the other day on, on uh, your, your views on advertising. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they asked me a similar question to some students about... Uh, about ladies. So I said, you see, uh, lady, women folk are being exploited to the limit. Absolutely. And to give an example, I said, Lucian Motors in Smith Street, Durban, they sell secondhand trucks. But on the trucks that they advertise, there's the woman in the bikini on top of the truck. Yeah. Jenny G. Knotts, they were here in Field Street, they moved to North Dean now. When they advertise tractors, they have a woman, a woman in the bikini on top of the tractor. Mm-hmm. So I'm asking, what has a woman in the bikini got to do with the second and truck of the tractor? That's right. Except the man. Mm-hmm. He'll be enticed to read because of that woman. Mm-hmm. Then I see a beautiful Edward saying, Cora solve your car. They said, no. She says, protect your interest. What your interest? A lady in the bikini. <laughs> but they're talking about Cora solving motor cars. <laughs> then BMW <laughs> has beaten the lot. <laughs> Uh, I see an advertiser in our daily news, local paper. It it's, uh, has a beautiful illustration of a um, BMW motor car. I'm not in the market for it. I had my Volkswagen Beetle, one, two, three, four, four, I had in succession, one after another. Then I had to buy a Golf because they don't make them anymore. <laughs> then I got my second Golf and I don't know the third one or what, I don't know. But I'm not in the market for a BMW. But I was forced to read this advert. BMW motor car. Beautiful illustration. In front of that motor car is a woman in the skimpiest of bikini, what you call the tanga, you know, the G-string. And she's standing in a, she's standing in a lustful enticing pose, yeah. as is inviting, come on, and it's written at the bottom, test drive her now. <laughs> Who? The woman of the car. She's barring the car. Test drive her now. So what are you doing to a women folk? Mm. See, the Westerner, he sells his mother, he sells his wife, he sells his daughter. Everything is for sale. Uh, you have business people, so I'm doing. Yeah. Everything is for sale. His wife is a star. So he's happy. My wife is a star. She's being brought on the screen. The guy is simulating sex and rape. And he, the guy is enjoying it. I said, you are sick. You people are sick. <laughs> Please pardon me. Yeah, I don't want to frighten you people away. <laughs> Just uh, Listen, now, what are you now? critical, I think. Now says, what is wrong? Everything for sale. So, in the house of Islam, the holy prophet Muhammad is said, Women, they are your mothers, they are your sisters, they are your daughters, they are your aunts. They are to be loved, respected, cherished and protected. They are not for sale. This thing is not for sale. I have my things to sell, my ways, but not my wife, not my daughter, not my mother. These are not for sale. 
See? So I don't advertise them. So I go, look, look at this, look at this, what I got. <laughs> I keep it behind. So Protection. I'm doing it. Ah, yes, I'm not going to do I think one gets the idea that um, that's fine. The impression, um, misconception, if you like. Shall I? Thank you. Ben? Is oh, that. Um, Women play a very secondary role. I think it's one of the. It's a. Uh, there are a few myths that uh, that uh, surround Islam, and uh, this one of women is one of them. The other one is the image with the Islam conquered by sword, you see, yes. militancy. Yeah. Yeah. And this has largely come in because of Islam's rapid spread to many lands. It has come up against cultural mm -hmm. situation. Mm -hmm. And Islam itself is not a cultural religion. Yeah. Like in this country, when I speak to many African people, they perceive it as an Indian religion. They say, no, it's not an Indian religion. We happen to be Asians, you know, whose forefathers were converted in India to the religion we've come in here. So in certain cultures, uh, like our forefathers were Hindus, and uh, you know, for example, what is the, the, the status that used to exist years ago, as far as the women is concerned. So some of these cultural things that we kind of inherited, which has no place for it on a legal basis, has been taken as representative of, of Islam and the religion. And this question on women that you, you rightly pointed out is one of those uh, very important ones. That one and the other one about this image with the sword, you know, everything was conquered with the sword, yeah. militancy. Now, um, the conversion process, um, what sort of thing is involved in that? It's very simple, ma'am. Yeah. You see, in Islam, um, number one says we have the, the same concept of God. So I start explaining to you, number one, the concept of God. We say we all believe in God. But if I told you, I said, you see, God Almighty, He's not like a man. He's not like a monkey. He's not like an elephant. He's not like a snake. He's not like anything we can think or imagine. He is absolutely a spiritual being, immaterial, right. ethereal. So I said, no, no, I accept that. Okay. You see, I, I accept that. I said, no, nah, in that case, you are a Muslim. Mm. But yeah. you might have got the wrong label on. Yeah. If you accept that, it's a right, you are a Muslim. But now, with that, goes certain obligation. You believe in God, you said, yes. I said, you see, God Almighty, he doesn't leave man alone. This most complex machinery, man. Mm -hmm. Every little thing that we make, we have instruction book. You know, how to use the washing machine, how to use the hair dryer, everything has got an instruction book. This most complex machine, man, no instruction book? <laughs> I said, no, it must have an instruction book. So I said, this instruction book was given by God Almighty through the prophets. He's telling you that this machine of mine, yes. I'm now gifting you with this machine, thou shalt not commit adultery, don't pollute it that way, don't drink, don't do this, don't do that and what things you ought to do and what you ought not to do. This is the instruction book. If you want this machine to last and prosper, these are, this is how you use it. So we said, instructions were given by God Almighty through the prophets. These were men like ourselves, like Moses, David, Solomon, Jesus, Muhammad. They were human beings like us, but they were so finely attuned that God Almighty could communicate with them on a higher spiritual level what we call revelation. And they in turn, they conveyed them to us on our human level, on our regular 600 miles an hour sound wave from electromagnetic waves of the spiritual world. So it tells you, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not commit thy neighbor's wife, thou shalt not kill. Now, that is how the man of, that man is speaking the words of God, but he is not God. We must love them, respect them, revere them, follow them, but worship none of them. You say, no, I accept that. I say, you are a Muslim. <laughs> so it's just now whatever label you might have a different label on you call yourself a Jehovah's Witness or a Seventh-day Adventist or a Hindu whatever if you think like me you are a Muslim you might have a wrong label on <laughs> in the house of Islam we are the closest to the Jew yes. religiously yes. and we are also closest to the Christian mm. this sounds like an anomaly oil and water we are closest to both how can you be I says no in the concept of the divinity the Jew says God Almighty is absolutely unique he has no partners he has no sons God is not seen at any time no man can see God and live 
and we give our hand of exceptions to the Jew that we believe as we believe. He says, no eating of the flesh of swine. We say we won't eat it. He says, no eating of blood. We say we won't touch it. He says, circumcision. We say we all circumcised. Come on, what more do you want? <laughs> the only real difference we have with the Jew is not religious. It is political. We are both fighting for a piece of land. Now that brings me on to the jihad, is it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, what does this actually constitute? Is it um, the holy war for um, the, the ground which is, comes back? To no, the holy war means anything you fight for the right cause. Mm -hmm. When Britain was defending herself against the Germans, mm -hmm. was that holy or not? We say it was holy. Mm -hmm. You want to give in? Is it right? Come and conquer, take over England and our empire as well? Mm -hmm. No, no, no. As the church you said, we'll fight them on the beaches, we'll fight them on the seashells <laughs> with our broomsticks and all. I said, right, that is jihad. Mm -hmm. Jihad means a struggle for a justice and right, uh, righteousness. Or we can be both misled. Like uh, in the Second World War, uh, both parties, the Germans and the Allies, they were both crying to God. And uh, one of our South African poets, he described it very beautifully. He said, God heard the embattled nations sing and shout. God this, God that, and God the other thing. You know, telling. So he says, good God, said God. I got my work shared out. <laughs> That's what we are doing. And I says, well, the German says, oh Lord, God, help me against this English, you know, this perfidious Albions. And the British is crying, oh Lord, is a help us against the Huns. <laughs> Both are telling God what to do. So we can be confused. But... From the German point of view, it was holy. <laughs> From the British point of view, it was holy. This is how. But now it doesn't mean objectively we sit back and look, we'll find that, no, this is not holy. What is your purpose? Why did you do this? But to the person, he can program himself, brainwash himself. This is holy. But it can be the unholiest of things, you see. Yes, ma'am. Another question I have is that, um, in some areas, I think Islam is seen to be excessively fanatical. Yes, yes. Um, for instance, in Iran, the mullahs mm. have so much power. Do you have different degrees of... Uh, you know, how do you actually... No, I think it's more that? loyalty. There's a lack of tolerance no, no, sometimes. No, no. It's more loyalty. Yeah. Is it like, say, the Roman Catholic? Yes. You see, among the Christians now, uh, well, whatever the Pope says, I accept. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, similarly, this man, we respect that. Look, this man, he's got no ulterior motives, and I can see his piety and goodness. So whatever he tells me, he can't be wrong. Mm. So that kind of dedication. Okay. And the Iranian people, who are Shias, they have that amount of greater dedication, like the Roman Catholics would have among you. Right. Right. They have a greater, you know, feeling for leadership, Mm -hmm. by His Holiness the Pope. Mm -hmm. He says, ex cathedra, you know, no pills, that's right, no pills. <laughs> he says, no divorce, he says, no divorce. <laughs> no more reasoning, don't talk, don't reason. So yeah. there are millions who will say, right, yeah. right, right. Similarly, that guy there, he has a greater this thing than us. We will start reasoning, he said, wait, 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 wait. wait. Let's examine what you say. Mm. Is it based on facts, what, what not? So we are as people who are not that emotionally carried away. Mm -hmm. as the other group. Like the Roman Catholics will be more emotionally carried away than the Protestants. Because you were trained now to ask questions. Martin Luther started it. See? So you keep on asking questions. So everybody's asking questions. Yeah. So you created all the different sects and denominations. Now, um, Salman Rushdie. Hmm? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry if no. you're asking an awkward question, but <laughs> Quite I have no answers in my mind to these things. <laughs> you know, you have every right to. You see, Rushdie happened to be born in the yeah. house of Islam. I mean, born a Muslim. Yes. In a Muslim home. Educated in Britain. Yes. At the age of eight, he was sent away by his father, thinking that, you know, once he's in Britain, he'll learn to speak English better and master the language. And we know it's a weapon. Language is a weapon. So he sends him overseas and uh, he takes writing as a career. A very good writer. So now he has an idea as the world's best seller. What? He says, now look, I can write a book and provoke 
the community. And I know it's like soda water, the guys will shout and this and that and they'll just better off. So he writes a book in which he besmirches the wives of the Prophet. But now I had to go to England on a lecture tour about this Rushdie fellow. And I went to the Royal Albert Hall. Mm. Yeah. We had 6,000 people turning up. And uh, I'm demonstrating to the audience, 6,000 people, that none of you have read the book. You are sitting in judgment. You know the book, what's wrong with writing? I said, look, you didn't read the book. So I make the chairman to read his preface. He's uh, quoting Daniel, Daniel Defoe, mm -hmm. where he's talking about the devil. Actually, he's describing himself. If you read that, he's, uh, he's talking about himself, who would But now, I told the chairman, read this to the audience and ask the question. Has anybody ever read this anywhere in the past 12 months? Please put up your hand. Anybody ever read this? Mm. And if you had read it, immediately it'll click. Yes, yeah, yeah, I read somewhere. Wait, I can't remember, but I read these words. Because so poetic, Daniel Defoe's you know, words about the devil. Out of 6,000, one person put up his hand. Mm. So right. That means he said he's read it, but we didn't have the chance to ask him, hey, maybe it was quoted in my book, which was given, maybe he read it in the book, my booklet, answering Rushdie. However, we didn't ask him the question. So I'm asking the people, I said, now look, what have you read? People generally. I said, you don't know what he wrote about you. Forget Muhammad and forget the wives of the Prophet. Forget the Muslims, you, you Britisher. I said, what does he say about you? Page 80. He says, <laughs> I, I can't even quote you. You British, you know. He says, sister, and he uses the word British. And you Americans. He says, mother, and he uses the word, <laughs> the four letter word, Americans. Did you read that? Then you white women, your mothers, your wife, your sister, you, uh, the Peter Mayer, you know, the, of Penguin. I'm asking Peter Mayer when I was in America. I said, I want the guy to come. I says, Peter Mayer, he's a Jew. I said, this guy Rushdie says, white women. White women, all. Never mind fat, Jewish, with a polynose, or non-differential. You can't make out the difference. Irish, Swiss, German, what? I can't make out the difference, but don't worry, as long as she's white. White women, no man, fat, Jewish or non-differential. White women are for and throwing away. I said, you Peter Mayer, that's your mother. He's talking about your mother. That's what they're supposed to do to your mother. You know, this the Africans and the Indians, we must read all this. Said, look, white women are for that purpose only. You know? So I said, now look, what have you read? You British, the first page, I says, he says, you Londoners are bastards. First page, it's a London as this is, you know, an accident took place and the guy is floating down and he shouts, this is the Londoners are bastards. I say, you Londoners, what are you? Indian Londoner? You're a bastard. <laughs> you are, what are you, Pakistani Londoner? You're a bastard. You British Londoner, English Londoner? You're a bastard. Whatever Londoners you are, you're all bastards. You accept that? He says, no, I said, look, damn it all, you're only looking about the other guy. I'm crying because it hurts me. He's swearing my mother. It was spiritually, the wives of the prophets are dearer and nearer to me than my own mother. So in the house of Islam, you can't besmirch anybody's name. See, the Western system law is beautiful for protecting the living. Yeah. I call any lady a whore. You have a right to take me to court. It's a defamation. I defamed you. Right? You have a right. But if I call your mother a whore and she's dead, you can't do anything to me. You're going to bring your wife, mother out of the grave to say, look, I'm not a whore. No, so I got away with it. So I said, you see, the Western law yeah. is beautiful for protecting the living. Mm. But what about the dead? Mm. Now, in Islam, we protect the dead and the living. You make any aspersions against any woman. He said, look, she's adulterous. Hmm? I said that? Right. Now, the Islamic law demands that I produce four eyewitnesses. Yeah. They must be eyewitnesses, not from hearsay, what I heard and... Mm, uh, I thought they went into the room and they must have asked, mm, did you see four eyewitnesses? So let's say I'm one of those devil and I pay three other persons say, look man, you talk like this and you tell like this and tell like that and we go to court. I say, all right, this woman here, she is she committed adultery. In cross-examination, if one of them fails, everybody gets 80 lashes each. You're going to say things like that? 
any more about any woman? Yeah, he'll be very careful. If one of them fails in the four, and the cross-examination, all the four gets 80 lashes, even if it was true. <laughs> so now I say, this is what, you say this is harsh, this is barbaric. I says you people are foolish. You see, you got wrong concepts of law and morality. Sutcliffe, he goes and rapes and rapes 13 women. Yeah. Rapes and rapes 13 women. Hmm? For which he gets a double life sentence. At the moment, he's enjoying in prison, you know, he's got a room to himself, he's got a TV set and a VCR, and he's studying law at the expense of the taxpayer, yeah. which I can't do for my son. Myself, at the standard seven, I went three days and I was kicked out because I had no fees. That guy now, he's becoming a lawyer at our expense. And for good behavior, in 20 years' time, he'll be out to write his memoirs and make a billion out of that. There's something wrong with your thinking. There's something very wrong. You see? Mm -hmm. Then, the guy in Atlanta, Georgia, he sodomized 21 boys and killed them. 21 boys. Mm -hmm. He's also enjoying a double life sentence. For good behavior, he'll be out in 20 years to write his memoirs and make a million out of that. Mm -hmm. There's something wrong with your thinking. Because those 21 boys were not your brothers. They were not your sons. Those women were not your mothers. They were not your daughters. Were they? No, no, it's only a number, 13. What does 13 number mean to you? Nothing. 13, so what? Then your concept of looking at justice. I says in San Francisco, a Caucasian, a white man, he raped nine women. And before killing them all, he used to burn them with cigarette stubs in the most sensitive parts. And he did so many tortures before killing them. Now, when the guy got caught, the jury system, yeah. that sentence in America, 12 out of 12, not 11 out of 12. 11 say the guy deserves to die, and one says, uh, I think, you know, we should give him double uh, life, double life. He said, right, give him double life. You know that penalty. 12 out of 12. In this case, 12 out of 12 of the jury says the guy deserves death. The good judge. You know what he said? He said, it is too merciful to kill him. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's, look, it's too merciful to kill him. Mm. So to you now, you are a sadist. You want the guy to linger in prison because you know it's, it's worse than killing. Mm. If you just kill him, cyanide pill, finish, girl. No, 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 no. You want to get the pleasure of keeping him alive. There are hundreds on the death row in America and maybe here in South Africa. They said, look, do away. We know we deserve death. This finish. They said, no, I want you to live. The guy said, I want to die. He said, no, 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 you are not. I want you to live. Are you compassionate or are you a sadist? I want you to answer that. I said, you Westerners, you are sadists. Look, the guy said, the good justice is too merciful to kill. Then what? So it is worth to give me my life. He said, yes, that's all right. That's what you want to do. So you are a sadist. You are not merciful. They're very hypocritical, that mm. I do know. No, they don't. They, they are don't. very confused. They're very confused. But our yeah. law system is hypocritical. It is. Totally, from beginning yeah. to end. So the Muslim man, he starts reasoning with you. Yeah. He said, look now, you, we seem, sound cruel, yeah. but the Holy Quran says, like life sentence now, capital punishment. You said, no, 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 we have no right to take life. I said, right. But this person took life already. He, I said, he, by taking my brother's life, has forfeited his life. He said, no, 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 we have no right to kill him. But what about he killed my brother? So you are telling very kind. You are very compassionate. The Quran says, in the taking of life, there is a saving of life. It sounds incongruous. By you taking life means the life for life. Guy commit murder, if you take his life, you're going to save life. You get rid of him, but the rest he says, no man, this is, no, I have to pay the price. You're going to save thousands of lives. Yeah. But otherwise, well, you know, I might be able to get out of it with this and at the worst life sentence and for good behavior, I'll be out in 20 years. Mm -hmm. I've got my way. In the taking of life, there's a saving of life. These ANC fellows, they had come to me. And uh, at the same time, they had taken out the manifesto or something to say, no capital punishment. I said, right, okay. I said, now, that in Soweto, that girls' hostel, yeah. there's 21 boys or so, they raided, and they took all those girls and they raped them. And one of them was mentally deficient. What they did to her is all the things were given to us in the news. I said, now, it was not the African going and raping white girls, huh? the African raping your own daughters. I said, if they were your daughters, what would you do? I said, kill. That's right. Not the human. He says, your sister, your daughter, if that guy did that, what would you do to him? 
Hmm. They said, kill him. I said, so, <laughs> but no, it's a double standard, you see, now because I said, no, okay. not for me. Yeah. Okay, no, no death sentence for my people, but for the African years or for the white years. No, no, no. The law should be for everybody. Right. You do such and such a crime, you're convicted, you forfeit your life. Now, once it's done, and in the house of Islam, you see, the law is not only to be uh, just, but it must be seen to be just. To be just yeah. The people must see it. So now, you committed a crime, you said, take him in the public place. Marketplace on Fridays after prayer. So right, this guy here deserves to have his head chopped off. Once you see that, shh, you won't commit the same crime. The Jewish law, the, the adult and the adults is stoned them to death. That's what the law of God says in your book. The adulterer and the adulteress, the Bible says, must be stoned to death. Ah, suppose this happens in some prison. You don't know what's going on, but. If you took him to the marketplace, and once you did it to one, I said thousands will have said, no, 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 not for me. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's, by you, you seem to be harsh and cruel, but what are you doing for humanity? Mm. In Saudi Arabia, a population of about 8 or 10, 15 million people, there is less crime in Saudi Arabia than in Washington, D.C. Yeah. Mm. You are the most civilized people on earth, and you can't control your beasts. In New York, no woman can be safe after that. Right. And you're supposed to be a civilized people. <laughs> they, you know, the women are able to walk around and do things, do the shopping. Nobody there. So say, shh, shh. <laughs> you know, it's time to say, shh, shh. <laughs> you can't do that. <laughs> so I said, look, I like my wife and daughters, you know, to be under those conditions that they can go around and without any fear on my part that, you know, she'll be raped, she'll be assaulted. Blah, blah, blah. But now you people are very kind and compassionate. So you created the monster. Yeah. Frankenstein monster for yourself. So I say, you pay the price. You pay the price. Murder in paradise. I don't know you heard that. I was reading uh, our uh, Sunday Tribune many years ago and the headline was Murder in Paradise. Very intriguing topic. Murder in paradise. So what's this? You know, I know about uh, Adam and Eve, you know, they're breaking the law, eating the forbidden fruit. That I know in paradise. But murder, <coughs> so I had to read. I'm reading Paradise Island, British possession in the, in the Pacific, in the Caribbean or somewhere. Paradise, Paradise Island. So a woman was found raped and murdered. A little place like the island there, just worked up into a frenzy, catch the guy, and the local police couldn't do it. So there's a now called the British Scotland Yard. So the Scotland Yard came, they failed. So eventually the thing cooled off. Everything does, it cooled off. After some time, again an identical murder and rape, rape and murder. Again the whole nation is roused, the little island, you know. And everybody is prepared now to get the guy and lynch him. <coughs> Because everybody's like a personal thing, you know. So it could be my mother, it could be my mother. Because the small place and the thing happened the second time. And this time they called Scotland Yard again. And this time they were fortunate they caught the culprit. Now, the same people who are wanting to lynch him, now they're listening to the court case. And in the court case, the good you know, advocate, lawyer, is saying, you know, his mother was a drunkard and his father was such and such, and, you know, poor fellow had a very hard upbringing <laughs> and started shedding crocodile tears. So the same people wanted to lynch the guy that's in a reprieve room now. Why? Because those two women, they were raped and killed, were not your sisters. They were not your daughters, they were not your mothers. It was just a woman, and I said, I look, the poor fellow had a rough time. <laughs> I said, there's something wrong with your thinking. Yeah. <laughs> this is Todd, please forgive me. Yeah, I you will say, say the Muslims are really tough breed, you know. Yeah. Very straightforward. <laughs> <laughs> Uncomplicated, really. <laughs> In the house of Islam, a man is convicted, for example. Convicted that he has committed the murder. Now the law says, as quick as possible, get rid of him. Why must we feed him with all this? He said, no, his last supper. What do you mean last supper? You know, give me a nice supper. What for? At whose expense? Your expense? Mm -hmm. Huh? This is a tax pay. Yeah. Quick as possible. So suppose we made a mistake. <clears throat> Our law, with all good intention, we can make mistakes. I say, if we made a mistake, God will reward him on the other side. Right. Yeah. You see? If, if he's a good man, let him go quickly. You know, his Lord will receive him. <laughs> if he's a bad guy, what the hell do you want to do with him here? Yeah. Let him go, <laughs> quick as possible. Either way, let him go and meet his Lord. 
Hmm? If we honestly made a mistake, God will forgive us. They said, oh Lord, look, according to the, the laws of evidence, we couldn't help it. You know, the whole jury sees that this guy is guilty, guilty, guilty. What can we do? And we made a mistake. We can still make mistakes. But it's something we said, the Lord will <laughs> rectify it on the other side. But we, we had no intention of doing injustice. But if he can't take a life, what gives you the right to take his life? How can you take a life? For I, any reason? How can you take somebody's life? No, because... What right he's taken a life? Right. So now, the Lord tells you. The Bible says, life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Your Bible says that. I so, right, right. So Jesus Christ he says, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am come not to destroy but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, heaven and earth shall pass away, but one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, or shall teach men so, shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall teach and do, shall be called great. Not the least, tiniest bit, one jot. Jot is the smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Like a T. I quite agree with you, but he also said, yes. I have come to add. Yes. And in my adding, if any man offend you, you must what turn the other mean? cheek. 70 times 7 times. Right. Now, I can't quote the Bible because I'm not that, <laughs> no, no, you don't have to. I'm not, um, <laughs> that good at it, and I don't remember people's names. These yes. are verses yes. in the Bible. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, but he did say, and that is where I think the credo of giving people another chance comes from is the is the teaching that he originally taught it might have been that people have used that for their own ends right. and people who don't truly believe in the rest of what he said have right. used that for their own ends and it's become corrupted but his whole idea behind the whole thing was to give to forgive and to give people a chance of repentance and that vengeance with the Lord and right. no one else's. Right. And that is where I think that credo has come from yes. in the West because the West, well, for many years, um, supposed itself to be largely Christian, although many Christians are purely nominal. I don't know if you have that in the no, Muslim faith. All, all, all. You we all have that. People who are nominal mm -hmm. and who are not sincere in the belief. Right, right. 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 And, um, <coughs> thank you. I don't think that I'm any kind of authority on Christianity because I'm I'm a student. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I feel that I'll be a student for if I live another 20 years, I'll still we, be a student. We'll all, all, all will be but, students. Um, I do believe what Christ taught, and I believe that in giving people another chance. But I do see what you're saying. That I know, and I've many times thought about it. Mm. It's easy enough to see hmm, somebody that you don't know die but if it happened to one of my sons how would i feel towards that person and would i be able to forgive that person and yet i do know of people who have who have forgiven and the forgiveness has not benefited the person they've forgiven but it has it has benefited themselves because they have rid themselves of that bitterness because bitterness destroys inwardly and um I, I can't suppose why Christ taught certain things because I'm not therefore to suppose. I don't say I believe blindly because I, I examine and I study and we all talk beautiful, and we discuss. Beautiful, beautiful, we must, yes. Uh, but that is where it comes from. It's, it's, base, it's a basic principle that Christ taught. Yes. That you should forgive. Yes. And um, no matter how terrible the thing is that the person does to you, you should forgive. And very often it's true, and I've seen it work, yes. that really horrible people yes. do terrible things to you. Right. And in your forgiveness mm. of them, in your forgiveness and really laying your soul bare and letting them stand on you, they will stand back and of their own accord say, wait a minute, what is this person? What am I that I'm doing this? I'm just doing it. No one's fighting me back, but I'm doing it. And what a disgusting creature I am. And then they they take hold of their lives and say, from this day on, I will, I want to change. And that is where forgiveness 
can heal people. And I'm not saying it always works. <clears throat> doesn't always work. Well, Jesus we, we, said, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Right. They did a terrible thing to him. Right, 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 yeah. right. So now, what has happened is this, <coughs> that we seem to have two contradictory type of statements. One is, he said, look, I am not come to destroy the law, the law, the Hebrew word for law is Torah, mm -hmm. meaning the first five books of Moses. Whatever the teachings, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not do this. Everything that is there is there, and I'm one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. And my understanding of English is fulfill means to fill up, not to take out. When you say you fill up the law, you make it tighter. And I am noticing that that's what he did actually. You see, the Jews had a law of divorce, they had a law of divorce. But before Moses, they used to do divorce, before Moses, the Jews, these human beings. <laughs> human kinds come together and there's a conflict and there's a separation. So they used to divorce, but now they, the man divorces his wife and uh, afterwards he changes his mind and he goes to his father-in-law's house and catches his wife and says, come on darling, back home. So what for? You divorced me. He says, no, no, no. I asked you to go for a little holiday and now you want to get another husband? Catch her by the hair and bring her back. Now that's the abuse. Yes. The law allows you, if you can't get together, no use hacking at one another or for a hundred years, part nicely. But now, the guy is playing the fools with the law, he divorces and now he goes back. So God Almighty, through Moses, straight tightens them, the law. He said, whosoever puts away his wife, let him give her a bill of divorcement. That's the advanced evolution of the law. That now you put it down into writing, so you can't say, I didn't divorce. Mm. Now, that's the evolution of the law, is evolving. But now, my cousins, the Jews, very ingenious people, so the guy gets married, and he's got half a dozen children through this wife of his, she's not the same anymore, he wants something nice and crisp. So, he said, look, there, there is a way out, there is a way out. Moses said, whosoever puts away his wife, let him give her a bill of divorcement. Mm. So he said, right, he writes out a bill, he said, darling, go. He gets somebody else, he gets her into difficulty, and he says, change again. He said, what did Moses say? He said, whosoever puts her his wife, let him give her a bill of divorcement. He's within the law. The law says you give her in writing, and that absolves you from other responsibilities. So the guy is now playing fast and loose with the law. There comes along another spiritual physician among the Jews, Jesus. He sees the sickness that the guy is playing the fools, man, he's too damn clever. So he takes away the privilege. As a man of God, he has a right. As a doctor, he can change the medicine. You know, he said, now this is the medicine for malaria, quinine. But maybe a time comes, no, quinine is very dangerous. It has other side effects. So he said, now give her panado. He said, right, okay, you change it. The doctor has a right to change. The man of God, the prophet of God has also a right to change. So he takes away that privilege from the Jews. He said, it has been said by them of old time, that whosoever puts away his wife, let him give her a bill of divorcement. But I say unto you, I am telling you now, whosoever puts away his wife, save for the cause of fornication, causes her to commit adultery. And whosoever marries her that is divorced, committed adultery. In other words, no divorce. Am I correct, man? No divorce. And if you divorce a woman, and if she remarries, her children are all bastards, and the Bible says, the bastard shall not enter the congregation of the Lord even to the tenth generation. Once you are a bastard, your ten generations are bastards. Now, I'm only quoting scripture. This is what the Bible says. The bastard shall not enter the congregation of the Lord even unto the tenth generation. You remember reading that before me? Yes. So that means once you are a bastard, your ten generations are bastards. Just because your husband and you couldn't agree. Yes. And now, you were a young woman in the prime of your life, you made a mistake in your glamour boy, and another guy comes along compassionate and says, look, you are beautiful, you are intelligent, everything, and he said, no, I will give her protection in marriage, but you are committing adultery, and your children are bastards for ten generations. He says, no, you have misunderstood the whole thing. This was a remedy for a sickness. You are playing fast and loose, so now the law is getting tighter for you. But Jesus, the same Jesus, he says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. 
you haven't got the capacity. You are like little children. And the proof of that statement, you cannot bear them now, means you can't grasp it now, is writ large in the New Testament. You read again and again, Jesus tells his disciples, ye of little faith, ye of little faith. How many times? Mm -hmm. Then when he speaks to them, explains to them as if he's explaining to little children, and they can't seem to understand. He said, are you even yet without understanding? And when he's provoked further, he says to his disciples, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I be with you? I say if he was a Japanese instead of a Jew, he would have committed an honorable harakiri. <laughs> everything he tells them, look, now you ask me, so I will tell you. I say everything he tells them, they misunderstood everything. Yeah. And the proof, I said, I give it to you, in front of you. John chapter 13, at the end, he says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. In my father's house, there are many mansions. If it was not so, I would have told you. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. You know where I'm going, and you know how to get there. You know, I assume you understand what I, Mrs. Todd, I'm speaking English, that's your language. You say, I think you understand what I say. So that's what he's trying to say. Look, you understand what I'm telling you. You know where I'm going, and you know how to get there. The answer? He said, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? The man said, look, you know what I'm talking about. He said, no, I don't know what you're talking about. See, Jesus is talking about spiritual matters. His disciples are thinking of geographical locations. They're thinking about Bloemfontein, Kimberley, Nell Sprite. He is talking about spiritual matters. They are thinking, therefore, they say, look, I don't know. Where, I don't know where you're going, and I don't know how to get there. So in answer to that, Jesus says, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The Zulu says, too heavy. <laughs> you know, look, he said, look, I am the way. That, if you want to know where I'm going, the way to God is personified in me. Real life is personified in me. Truth is personified in me. Look at me. If you want to go where I'm going, you follow me. You will reach there. It's too heavy. Yeah. So they said, <laughs> he said, look, all this what you're talking about, <laughs> this hitting over your heads. He said, look, just show us the Father and he suffice at us. All this what you're talking about, fancy things, I don't know what you're talking about. Just show us God and that will give us satisfaction enough. So Jesus says, Philip, you have been with me for so long. Why ask us now, show us the Father? If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Again, they misunderstood. Everybody, each hundred percent. From the word go, they misunderstood where he's going. Then he's telling, I'm the way that they misunderstood. Now he said, look, Philip, you with me for so long. You as a Jew, you ought to know better than that. You know, God is not seen at any time. No man can see God and live. How can you make such a silly request? If you know me, if you understand what I am, you will understand what God is. You haven't understood me, how can you understand God? No, no, he says, he's, he's God. He's the Father. Is that what he said, that he's his own Father? How can he be his own Father? He took his seed and put it into his mother and he came out. No, no, I said, look, you see, the trouble is, this Jewish book, the Bible, is a Jewish book, full of Jewish metaphors and similes, of which the Westerner has got no experience whatsoever. Please, forgive me. I'm talking about your DDs. You see, I, mean, I talk to them, you know, your DDs and your professors. I said, look, you haven't got a concept. You are using a Jewish book with Jewish metaphors and similes about which you have no experience. So what was metaphorical to the Jew has become literal to the Greek. And they are the pioneers of that message to the Western world. And you in turn to the Indians and the Africans. You are looking at a Jewish book through Greek glasses. You see the Jews... <laughs> no, please, please. Well, no, I don't know what's allowed. Is anybody Greek here? <laughs> you see, through Greek glasses, you see the Jews had the idea of sons of God. Sons of God mean a righteous person, holy person. Now, a new idea goes among the Greeks and the Romans that their new son of God had just come into Palestine. You know, a man of God. Now, what was metaphorical? Yeah. Because God has got sons by the tons in your Bible. Book of Genesis chapter 6 is, and the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them to wife all that they chose. Verse 6 is, and when the sons of God came in and to the daughters of men and brought children to them, they became great men of old, men of renown. How many sons did he have? In African scenes. Many. Then in the book of Exodus, God says, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. In the book of Jeremiah, says, Ephraim is my son, even my firstborn. Then in the New Testament, we are told, as many as are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. It means if you follow the will and plan of God, you are a godly person. In the language of the Jew, you are a child of God, son of God. That's what it meant. But now that message goes among the Greeks, and they had the men gods beyond counting. 
They had the Jupiter, the god of heaven, Vulcan, the god of fire, Neptune, the god of the sea. Uh, well, as Zeus was the father of all these gods with his many wives and many children, this is mythology. Pure mythology. But to a people who believe in mythology, mythology is not mythology, it's real. So they were imagining that this guy, uh, Zeus, was sitting on some planet with his wives and many wives and children, and he was sending his sons into the world, his Horus, his Isis, his Osiris, his Apollo, his Gemini. You know, all these, your projects you're giving names to all these Greek gods. So now, all these were being sent into the world, so now among them comes a new son of God, Jesus Christ. So what was metaphorical to the Jew became little to the Greek. And now you are looking at the Jewish book through Greek glasses. So I said, now, nah, therefore we have a problem. A Jewish book, you must look at it as a Jew. An Englishman telling me, this wife is a peach. What does he say? Means she is perfect in looks, in speech, in behavior. She is a picture of perfection. That's what he means. But I go and tell it to my African friend. He says, you know this Englishman, Ruinek, he's got a pescas as a wife. <laughs> Three shillings a dozen. Does it make sense? No, no, that's what he said. His wife is a peach. Is she a peach? Three shillings a dozen? That's the value of his wife? worried me. No, no. Sure. So, so I said, no, you have to look at a Jewish book through Jewish eyes. Mm. Muslim book through Muslim eyes. Then he said, now look, I don't agree with you. Or I don't agree with you. Jesus says, let the, let the dead bury the dead. How can dead people go and bury bad people? <laughs> hmm? He says, seeing they see not, hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. How can you see and not see? How can you hear and not hear? No, no. You have to look at a Jewish book through Jewish glasses. No problem. There's no, I'm, I'm not finding faults. I'm only telling you that, look, you are looking at the book with different type of glasses. Right. 
they could stand up and they could convince you that black was white and white was black very often. Right. Well, right. maybe not you, maybe not me, but there correct. were an awful lot of people they could convince. Correct, correct. And that basically God, God is not looking for those people. Yes. Because those people could misuse and abuse his power. But it's the ordinary folk, the humble folk, yes. that he can use. Yes portray what he's getting at. Yes. And whilst I know you and I will never see eye to eye on the concept of Jesus Christ, yes. I think that the actual our um, approach to people as a whole, yes. our desire for them to be peaceful and to, to coexist without bitterness and without this frenzied uh, I am this and I am that and you are that. I think I think that is a very true essence amongst all of us. Because in this country we've seen what it does to people. I think every country probably sees it. But maybe I'm I'm being partisan here and saying we know more about it than other countries. But really I think we do know a lot about it because there's so many different we really are a mixed bunch in yeah. Southern Africa. Now let let's this book here. You see there's a common denominator between us between us and that is Jesus Christ he said that if I don't go he won't come nevertheless I tell you the truth it is expedient for you that I go away John chapter 16 verse 7 it is expedient this is simple English mm. it is expedient for you it's better for you that I go away for if I go not away the comforter will not come unto you but if I go I will send him he's not talking about himself if I don't go, he won't come. But if I go, I will send him. That is the Holy Spirit. Right. So now, he says, if it is the Holy Spirit, see, now we are, you know, we are mature people. It's, that's the easiest thing in the world to say, is the Holy Spirit. I said, right, wait, 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 wait. He's telling you that if I go, don't go, he won't come. But if I go, I will send him. So that means the Holy Spirit was not there with him. This comforter was not there with him. If it is the Holy Spirit, then it doesn't make sense because in the book of Luke, first chapter, verse 41, it tells us that Elizabeth had the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, before Jesus was born. Did she? Luke, if you want me to get the Bible, open it and read it. Luke chapter 1, verse 41 says, and Elizabeth had the Holy Ghost. Then it says, and John the Baptist had the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. Did he? That's what your book says. He had the, what it means, I don't understand. But it says, and John the Baptist had the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. Then it tells us that this Holy Ghost was helping Jesus in his ministry, was helping the disciples. Because when they went out on the mission of preaching and healing, <coughs> I'm asking with whose help, if not the help of the Holy Ghost, when they did the miracles, the disciples. <coughs> and they preached, the disciples, with whose help? Then before Jesus parted, he said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Receive means, like I'm saying, receive this holy book. But I won't give it to you. <laughs> you think that's what Jesus did? He said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Did they or didn't they? They received it on his resurrection. No, he said, receive. I'm telling you, receive now, not when you die and when you're resurrected, you'll get this book. No, I no, said, no, not this. Receive this, brother. Yes. Receive this. My, my sister, I said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Did Elizabeth have the Holy Ghost? The Holy Ghost came upon her. Right, so she had it. Right. Did John the Baptist have the Holy Ghost? You had them. He, he then, then he says, if I don't go, he won't come. But he's there already with everybody. Everybody seems to have got the Holy Ghost. And you say, no. He say, he, he's going to he say, afterwards. What do you mean afterwards? Elizabeth had it. John the Baptist had it. The disciples of Jesus had it. And Jesus said, receive. Then he said, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you to all truth. All your problems he's going to solve. So 2,000 years have gone, and I'm asking all the people who claim to have the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, every church says it, Jehovah's Witnesses said they got it, Seventh-day Adventists they say got it, and the Lutherans, the Roman Catholics, the Dutch Reformed churches, everybody says he's got the Holy Ghost. Unless they're all lying. They all say they got it, so I'm asking them, this Holy Ghost in 2,000 years, what did he tell you about problem of racism? Which Jesus already didn't tell you, give me. I want only one, he said, I have yet many, many in English means more than one. And he'll guide you into all truth, all means more than one, I take it. 
I just want one new thing that the Holy Ghost told any Christian church in 2000 years, which Jesus already didn't tell you in so many different words, one. And you have a good excuse to say, look, I am not a mission. I am not a DD, doctor of divinity. But I said, look, have you got a priest who knows something? Priest, you got a bishop? Anybody who's prepared to sit and chat with me? I am prepared to organize a meeting. What church you belong to, ma'am? Yourself? The Emmanuel New Covenant. Right. Is it a Catholic institution? No. No. That sounds like Emmanuel Cathedral here, you know, so I was no, wondering. Right. Not. So now, you have a big man of your church. I am prepared to organize a meeting in King's Park at my expense to discuss. You know, it's like the divinity of Christ. Is Jesus God? You believe he's God. That means your, your priest also believes he's God. I said, look, we will discuss. I'll get 40,000 people there at my expense. Come and talk to them. For nothing, you get something bonsella. Like this, I said, look, come. What am I asking you? I'm not asking for anything. But I says, now, if you have a man who you think he knows anything about religion, come along and present your case at my expense to 40,000 people. I will advertise. I'll get the 40,000. You just come and speak for an hour. He said, look, Jesus is God, and you have to believe, otherwise you'll go to hell. Because salvation only comes with the blood of the Lord Jesus. So that, come and deliver your message. At my expense, I get 40,000 customers for you. If you say no, then something wrong with you, with your truth. You agree? If your minister, whatever, with the Roman Catholic or Lutheran or Presbyterian, when I create an opportunity for you in King's Park to get 40,000 people at my expense, and you're not prepared to come and talk, there's something wrong with you, madam. Do you if you've got something to sell. The whole thing comes back to the misunderstanding of the interpretation. Right. That's what I want the Nobody's people. Got to correct, prove correct, correct, correct. No, no. So what it means is now, while I'm talking to the people, I know that in the 40,000 people, I said at least 30,000 will say, no, this Didat fellow has got the right idea. Our minister hasn't got the right concept. That's all. So there's no votes taken. You know, I said, now who won and who lost? <laughs> Nothing. We just, you present your case. I present my case. It's not a debate, a symposium at my expense. And believe me, there isn't a Christian born in this country, especially a white Christian who's prepared to take up the challenge. I give you, if you have a bishop, I give you 10,000 ran, any of you. If you can get me your bishop to enter into a symposium. Symposium, not debate, symposium. You present your case, you say Christ died for your sins. So we'll say, no, Christ didn't die for anybody's sins. I say, you, see, you are misreading the book. Simple, basic English you have misunderstood. Jesus, when he returns after three days, after his alleged crucifixion, he goes into that place where they had the Last Supper, and when he says, peace be unto you, the disciples are terrified. So I'm asking, why should they be terrified? If you meet your long lost master, your uncle, your grandfather, we are happy as oh, our uncle, especially Eastern people, the Jews and the Arabs. We embrace one another, we kiss one another. Instead of doing that, they're terrified. I wonder why they're terrified. So Luke tells us, he said they were affrighted because they thought he was a spirit. He says they thought he was a spirit. So I'm asking, did he look like a spirit? Whole world says no. Then I said, why should they think the man is a spirit when he didn't look like one? No, your English, your language I'm talking about was written there in black and white. So I said, you see, the reason is because the disciples of Jesus, they were not eyewitnesses or hear, hear witnesses to the happenings. They only heard everything from hearsay. Mark chapter 14, verse 50, he tells us that at the most comfortable juncture in the life of Jesus, all his disciples for him and fled. All. I'm asking, Mrs. Todd, does all, all, all mean all in your language? All me, does it mean all? <laughs> so, so they were not there. So now, because all the knowledge is sort of hearsay, they're thinking they heard the man was crucified, he gave up the ghost, means he had died, now he's dead and buried for three days, they expect him to be stinking in his grave. Such a man, you see, naturally, they're terrified. So Jesus says, in answer to assuage the fears, he said, behold my hands and my feet. This is basic English, King's English, or our Queen's English. Behold, have a look at my hands and my feet, that it is I myself, I'm the same fellow man, damn fools, what are you afraid of me for? He said, handle me and see, for a spirit has no flesh and bones as you see me have. Mm. If I am a spirit, I won't have this, so if I got this, I'm not that. Simple basic English, I want to talk to some English people who know English. 
a DD if he knows English. He said, come to, he said, a spirit has no flesh and bones as you see me have. And they felt him and they believed not for joy. I'm reading, I'm reading what our book says. And wondered, what happened, man? We thought the man was dead and buried. So he says, have you any meat, something to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and a honeycomb. And he took it and he ate in the very sight to prove what? There is a ghost, there is a spook, there is a spirit. No, I'm the same fellow, man. Damn fools, what are you afraid of me for? So now, I said, come, talk to me. I want some English-speaking people to tell me, Mr. D, Dad, you don't understand English. You see, in English, when you say a spirit has no flesh and bones, it means a spirit has flesh and bones. I want an English people, or the Zulu to come and tell me, they say, Gogoba itongo, alina ni yama I said, come and tell me. Or you Africana, when the khiasa ni flies and be an associalist in that egg hat me. You Africana, come and tell me that in my language, when it says, the spirit, it doesn't mean that, Mr. D, that you don't know my language. I'm talking your language, not Hebrew, not Greek. I said, the language that you speak, in your language I read the book. And I said, look, this is how I have understood or misunderstood. Please help me. And there isn't a Christian born who's prepared to help me. There's something wrong. And I'm telling you, come and tell in public. Let demonstrate to the world. He said, look, this guy doesn't know English. But he didn't say he was a spirit. He was not a spirit. No, but the resurrected, the, no, no, resurrected body. in the flesh and blood. Once you resurrected, Jesus is telling you, when you are resurrected, you become a spirit. Paul says, it is ordained unto all. All men wants to die, and after that, the judgment. He says, that which is dead, it is sown a physical body, and it is raised a spiritual body. Does he say that? You are raised a spiritual body, so, but God is able. No. He doesn't say, but God is able and he did it to Jesus. He says, look, this is the law of God that once you die, when we bury you in, in weakness and we raise you in power, we bury you, you know, we, and in this, and he says, we bury you a physical body and raise up a spiritual body. Then Jesus is talking about that woman. The Jews came to him. He says, you know, master, there was a woman among us. She had seven husbands, according to Jewish practice. Seven guys had her. We want to know at the resurrection which guy is going to have her because they all had her here. You remember that? Mm. Right. So what does Jesus say to that? He says, in answer to that, he says, you see that, this is the resurrected body, he says, neither shall they die anymore. If you are resurrected, you will be immortalized. You can't die again. You see, Paul said, it is ordained unto all men once to die. And after that, the judgment, you can't die twice. So he said, it is ordained unto all men once to die. He says here, that that person who is dead, see, once they are resurrected, they will not, they will be spiritualized. They will be, they will be angelized. They will be spiritualized. They will be spiritual creatures. They will be spirits. For they are equal unto the angels and the children of God. For such are the children of the resurrection. Such. What? Spirits. Jesus says there'll be spirits, Paul says there'll be spirits, you say there'll be spirits, because it's only these bodies coming up from the grave, from Adam to eternity. Can you imagine every human being with this flesh and blood walking this earth? They will be, you know, you'll be walking in your own mess. But doesn't this bring us back to the fact that you, um, we're now talking about a, a translation into English, and again, how many... No, 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 there's that, nothing wrong with the translation. You must tell me that the translation is wrong. So the Christian must tell me that our learned men, they didn't translate properly. The man is telling you a spirit has no flesh and bones. Yeah. It translated correctly. Yeah. But your understanding, because now your salvation depends on that. <laughs> so you, see, now, you are now, you feel that, look, I'm going to lose salvation. This guy is taking salvation away from me. No, no. This is where the problem is. You are not thinking and you're not reading what's written there. We must read what is written there. The man tells you that a spirit has no flesh and bones. He's telling you that. He doesn't say, except me. Now, in my case, is, he's talking, no exception. Just the spirit. And then to want to assure them, he says, look, I'm the same fellow, man. Something to eat, and he starts eating broiled fish and honeycomb. To prove what? He's resurrected, or that he's the same? What is he proving? So, you see, he said, now, look, we are all begging the question, because, man, this is my salvation. I can't help it. You know, I, I can I let go? It's an easier way. Now, in John, first episode of John, chapter 4, verse, verse 1, verse 3 says, it says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Mm. You remember that? Mm. Right. The false prophet is a false spirit, true prophet is a true spirit. This word spirit is used synonymous here for a prophet. 
Beloved, beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. How do you know a false prophet? He's got a false spirit. True prophet? He's got a true spirit. But how are we to know? He said, the spirit that confesseth that Jesus is the Christ is of God. You read that? The spirit that confesseth that, look, he said that Jesus is the true Messiah, Christ, the Messiah, is of God. You remember reading that? Mm. Right. So I said, now look, this is your book is giving you a test to apply. But you are te- people are terrified. I'm telling you, look, this is what he said. To find out the truth from the false, this test is that if this prophet comes to you and he says he's a prophet of God, ask him, is Jesus the Christ? He says, no. Then you are told to reject him. Fair? Fair. That's what it says there, that look, the spirit that confesseth that Jesus is the Christ of God means this is a true prophet. So now you open chapter 3. I give you the page. Chapter 3. Chapter 3. This is the book we are presenting you. So you can open up chapter 3 there. I give page uh, chapter 3. Page verse 42. Chapter 3. Page number 42 will be page 134. Right. Page 134. Very easy to write. Page 134. Page 134. Got it, ma'am? I'm looking at verse 45 now. It says, Behold, the angel said, O Mary, God giveth thee glad tidings of a word from him. His name will be Christ Jesus. You read it, sir? It says in Arabic, Masihu, same as Messiah. Masihu is ibn Maryama. Jesus Christ, the son of Mary. So Muhammad is testifying that Jesus is the Christ. That's the book. That's the book of Islam. What do you want to know? That he was born miraculously. The same verses on. You read there, page 40, uh, verse 47, next page. She said, when she's given the good news about the birth of, uh, of a holy son, she said, Oh my Lord, how shall I have a son when no man has touched me? He said, the angel says in reply, even so, God created what he willeth. When he had decreed a plan, he but said to it, be and it is. And God will teach him the book and wisdom, the law and the gospel. Talking about Jesus Christ. Muhammad testifies that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the true messenger of God, and he was born miraculously, which many modern day Christians don't believe today. This is 1,400 year old book that you are reading now. 1400 years ago, this is what Muhammad says about Jesus. That Jesus Christ was one of the mightiest messengers of God. He was born miraculously. He gave life to the dead by God's permission. He healed those born blind and the lepers by God's permission. But he's not God and he's not physically not his son. So now we can reason. He's not God. You still know he's God. He said, let, let us reason. Yeah. Come. The Bible says, come, let us reason together. The Quran says, Ya halal kitab ta'alu. So oh, people of the book, come. Let's come. Let's talk. What are you afraid of? If you are afraid, then there's something wrong. I wouldn't have spoken all these things if it wasn't that I was touched to speak about. Otherwise, it would have been just a nice, nice cream and you should yeah. have finished off. And you might have gone, you know, more happier than maybe now. I don't know. But now, this book here, this encyclopedia, which is being presented to you, 2,000 pages, I don't expect anybody to wade through it. It's too much, especially when we are all involved in a rat race. At the back of this volume is an index. Just browse through the index. What do you want to know? Anything you want to know. What do you want to know? You want to know about marriage? You'll find under M. You want to know about divorce? You'll find under D. You want to know about heaven or hell? Under H. You want to know about Jesus? Under J. So open Jesus. You want to know anything about Jesus? So let's see. J. J. Jesus. Jesus. Page 1837. 1837. 1837. 1837. 1837. Jesus. Yes, got it? 1837. Yes, ma'am. 1837. Yes. 1837 is Jesus. You see that? No, right at the end, Ben. Yeah. Right at the end. Right at the end. Right at the end. 1837. 1837. You're getting near it. Still for J. J. Look like a dictionary. Look for J now. In that moment. Right. Jesus. First item is a righteous prophet. Is a true prophet of God. Jesus. 
Second item, his birth, described in two places. His apostle to Israel, his disciples, taken up, like Adam, not crucified, no more than apostle, not God, sent with gospel, not son of God. His message and miracles, he prays for table of viands, he taught no false worship, he de his disciples declare themselves Muslims, his mission limited. His followers have compassion and mercy, his disciples as God's helpers, as a sign, prophesied Ahmad, which is the comforter, Muhammad. So, now, you don't have to agree with everything that you read. You see, you say, now look, this is what this book says. You don't have to swallow it. You say, now look, but I don't accept this. You say, right, let us come reason together. Maybe we might be able to see the light. Maybe you can rectify us. You say, no, you people are very good people, sincere people, but, you know, you have lost us on salvation. Which way? He said, like this, like that, like that. We can reason. Then at the end of it, suppose I don't accept, stubbornly. No, I'm destined for hell. It's a sure step. He said, look, no. he said, look, you could see it because when you show me, if I show you something, you can see, but sometimes vested interests, they require of us to deny. I said, no, I can't see it. I can't see it. But in your house of heart, in my house of heart, I know. Mm -hmm. So what happens? The stamp is on. You, destined for hell forever. Me, destined for hell forever. Because you were not true to yourself. Mm -hmm. So that is left to God. But for us now, we go through it and say, look, uh -huh, I can see it about God. What he says about God? He said, no, I agree, I agree, I agree. Everything he says about God, I say, I agree. But the only thing is now, I said, that God is Jesus. So he said, no, wait a minute. Now, this book says, no, he's not God. And he's not the begotten son of God. Begetting is an animal act. It belongs to the lower animal functions of sex. We are not to attribute such a quality to God, the Muslim reasons. He said, no, no, but you see, God, he's the only, be he's the only begotten son. Because you said, now he's the only son. I said, no, you don't know your Bible. God has got sons by the tons in your Bible. But he said, no, he's the only begotten son. I said, you see, this word begotten in the first, in chapter 3 of John, John 3, 6, so 16, he says, and God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son for sacrifice. I said, now you look, every modern translation of the Bible done by your learned men, the word begotten is thrown out as a fabrication. We did it. This book says, yes. So yeah, right. running a little right. past the, the schedule time. <laughs> okay. So, I would like to bring the proceedings to a close. I'm sure we can chat informally after that. Sure. It is my indeed a pleasure to have had you people here. And I'd like to call upon the president of the Durban Businesswoman and Professional Staff to uh, say a few words, Barbara and Todd. Pleasure. Thank you. Mr. Didat, Mr. Lockett, um, I'd like to thank you all on behalf of our club for a most enlightening experience. We've been quite overwhelmed with the welcome that we have received here today. Um, I hope that we can actually come back again because I think we have absorbed a tremendous amount <laughs> and there is so much to learn and so much talking to be done in order to try and build the bridges of understanding as you yourselves have said. It's been very enlightening for me. Um, I certainly have had my eyes opened on many misconceptions that I think many, many people have. And I'd like to thank you for the tremendous hospitality and I'm delighted to receive a copy of the Quran. I've wanted one for years and years and years. <laughs> My God. My <laughs> thank God. you so yes. much. Yes, pleasure. Yes. Um, no, we are right. free now if you want to say something. But uh, if you have any contact, like with Bishop Hurley, 10,000... No, 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 for example. We don't, we don't no, no. have that, Mr. Didat, my, my group, are, we're charismatic. Yes. We are not um, the Orthodox Church at all, yes, believe yes, me. Yes, yes, yes. We are not aligned to any of them, yes. and not that we are against any of them. Yes, yes. We have combined services with all of them. Yes. Uh, it's just simply that we have a preference, a type of worship which is preferential to us. Right, right. Just as some people like wearing I, I like wearing a certain type of clothing right, and look right. very stupid on somebody right. who are shorter perhaps. Right, right, right. But um, it's just our particular preference, yes. but ours is, a, is not uh, known in that way. We, yes. we are, a, we put it, a, a quieter group, a sort of a, more a family loving group, if you know what I'm yes. saying. Yes, yes. No, I appreciate We're not, we don't, the big advertisement, yes. you don't have the big shots yes, yes. or anything like yes. that. No, even then, a group, there's a church group. Mm. We don't mind, you know, taking your church group around, and then you have people who might be a little more 
experience in the scriptures than yourself. You right, right, right. I'm sure. Oh, sure. So now at least then 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 you can sit back relaxed. You see and listen. Yeah. It's easier that way than say no look directly the man is asking me and you know says look I'm not equipped. No, Which, I'm not no, 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 I appreciate it. And I would, I would actually be do, doing our teachings a, a disservice. Correct, agreed, agreed, I mean? agreed, 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 as, as, as it is. Agreed, man. But now, suppose you tell yourself, look, I've been, and there's something like new things this guy is talking about. Everything that we say, he, the guy says, no, you have misunderstood. You know, either your, your charismatic group or the Roman Catholic Church <coughs> or the Methodist Church or any. I said, look, you have misunderstood. So now, if, you, if I think you have misunderstood, and I'm prepared to sit and allow you to reprogram me, I want to listen to you. Come, tell me where I have gone off. How is it that I haven't understood your English Bible? I said, look, I understand. I think every word that's written there, a spirit has no flesh and bones. Now, explain that to me. Jesus Christ, you see, he was ever in hiding. He never came out into the open. He gave a sign to the Jews. He said, the only sign. You remember? He said, for this is an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, but there shall no sign be given unto it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. Look, he's giving you a sign, the proof, his certificate that I'm a true man. And this is the proof, the sign, the miracle. So I'm asking the learned men of Christianity, what was that sign? Finish. Believe me, look, there isn't a Christian learned man I've come up with. You say, Jesus gave a sign. Matthew chapter 12, verse 30, 39, and 40. He gave a sign. The only sign, the sign of Jonah. So I'm asking, what was the sign of Jonah? Finish. Believe me, look, I'm telling you, this is my 40 years experience with the learned men of Christianity, not with ordinary people. What was the sign? I said, look, if you want to know what the sign is, I said, go to the book of Jonah. It's only one page in an encyclopedia of 2,000 pages also. One page. It won't take you two minutes to read. But you don't have to do that even. Every Sunday school child knows the story of Jonah. I take it. Every Muslim, Hindu, Christian, everybody knows Jonah and the whale. Mm. So I said, you know, Jonah was sent to the Ninevites. If you remember, God tells him to go to Nineveh to warn the people to repent in sackcloth and in ashes. But instead of going to Nineveh, he goes to Joppa, modern Jaffa, and he takes a boat and is running away. So at sea there's a storm, and according to the superstitions of the mariners, anybody who runs away from his master's command creates such a turmoil at sea. So they begin to question, who can be responsible for this? The storm is not subsiding. So Jonah realizes that he is a guilty man because he is running away from his duty. God tells him to go to Nineveh and he is running away to Joppa, uh, Jab, Tarshish. So he said, look, I am the guilty man. Throw me overboard and it will be all right with you. God is after my blood and in the process he is going to sink the boat, but you innocent people will die. You rather take me and throw me overboard. They said, no, 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 no. You may be a good man since we saw you, nice man, holy man. Maybe you want to commit suicide. You want us to help you. Mm -hmm. We won't do that. We have our own system of knowing right from wrong. And that is what is called casting of lots, head or tail, head or tail. And according to the casting of the lot, it came to the turn of Jonah that Jonah was a guilty man. So far, so good. Correct, man? I couldn't tell you exactly. No. I'm not that first. I'm more versed on the New Testament than you are, believe me. No, but this New Testament, Jesus tells you. Have you read it? So, yes, so now he's telling you the only sign is that of Jonah. Yeah. So if you want, we can go to the book of Jonah, one page. It won't take you two minutes, but you don't have to do that because everyone knows the story. So when they threw Jonah into the sea, my question to the learned men of Christianity is, was he dead or was he alive? And they all say he was alive. Mm. A fish comes and gobbles him dead or alive. You say he was alive. From the fish's belly, he prays to God for help. All that you know. Yeah. He asks God for help. Do dead people pray? No. So he was alive. You said yes. On the third day, vomits him on the seashore, alive. He's thrown into the sea alive, and he comes out alive. He was alive, 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 alive. Am I correct? Am I correct? Yes, he was alive. Now Jesus said, for as Jonah was, so shall the son of man be. Just like Jonah. So I'm asking, how was Jonah for three days and three nights in the Baal's valley? Everybody said he was alive. So I said, how was Jesus for three days and three nights in the belly of the earth? You say he was dead. I say, in your language, is that like or unlike? Dead should be alive. 
in your language, I want to know you Africans in your language, you Zulu in your language, in your English people in your language, is that like or unlike? Jesus said, I will be like Jonah, and you telling me, your church, every church, that he was unlike Jonah. I want to know who's lying, you or Jesus. Yeah. So I want the people to talk to me. I want to know who's lying. <laughs> so, <laughs> for another day. I look forward to a meeting. Please, please, you know, I'll feel greatly honored. On and on and on and on. <laughs> you nice are an incredibly learned man, Mr. Didat. <laughs> oh, my word. But what am I trying to do? I want to show you. I said, look, if I'm wrong, you prove to me. I said, look, I said, is this like in your language? She said, I'll be like Jonah. Now, is that in your language like or unlike? You say unlike. So I want to know who is lying, you or him. Jesus is lying or yeah. you lying? You thousand million Christians, one billion Christians. Are you all liars or Jesus Christ was a liar? You tell me. <laughs> <laughs> so that's your answer. Mr. D. Dad went for a standard six in school. <laughs> really? That's right. But I can understand how it upsets some people when I you know, come no, out no. Salvation. This is a salvation now. I'm telling you, is this like or unlike? So your salvation. You don't, people don't want to answer. I said, look, in your language. One is Swas Yona or Ni Swas Yona? Jengo Chona or Angai Jengo Chona? No, I find it very interesting. From okay. our own personal point of view, as just a human being, I find the message that we must um, But um, at the same time, I have a little query in my mind of what you've been saying. If you, do you, do you, do you, do you, believe in the power of Satan? Far more than that. Yes. Yes. Do you believe there are such things as Satan worshippers? There are. They say there's a cult called Satan worship a cult. I think what Dada gave me something about it. They're very opposed to anything that is aligned with the cross. Because they like to desecrate crosses and that sort of thing. So they are... Very dedicated well, in their expression of being in touch with Jesus Christ. Right, 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 right. right. As far as they're concerned, he right. is the boss of the church. Right. Satan is on one hand, and Christianity also. Now, Jesus definitely has recorded that you shall no longer. Has maintained that you shall no longer. Has recorded that you shall turn. They're the chief. Seventeen times seven. No, no, you again, again, no, no, we can discuss this. So again, I said, look, this is the most hypocritical of all talks that you are doing. No, no, the whole 2,000 years, no, no, for 2,000 years, Christianity hasn't. So that means it was an absolute failure. The whole religion is a failure. Huh? No, 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 the religion never said, if this is the true understanding, all your conquest of the world, by turning the other cheek, you as good Christians, then what? No, no, you conquered it already. Australia, you, you eliminated the aborigines of Australia. You did, no, no, your nations, your, the, the Red Indians of the Red Indians of America, you wiped them out. You see, genocides, genocides. But they, they, for religious freedom, they went there. That is a story, political story, a political story that used so, it and so. hid behind it like it was a screen to whitewash all the So when will you have the pleasure one group comes again, and all the people are going to be the president. No, 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 the only thing is, I think the argument is coming to the doors, and I don't like that. You know what I mean? Jesus Christ was a pacifist. Jesus was a pacifist. Jesus was a pacifist. It's continuous. No, no. The argument with the Jews, you generation of white, you white at separatists.